So uh, I started diving and snorkeling when I was uh, six, seven years old. Uh, by the age of 10, I was uh, free diving and spear fishing. And uh, I could dive with my first shark when I was 13 years old. It was a small uh, black tip shark in Indonesia. Came across him in, uh, on the corner of a reef. And I was as surprised I, as that uh, animal was. And uh, somehow he was even more uh, scared than I was. And then my mind started to, to think about these encounters. And uh, that in fact, sharks are not dangerous animals. They're just curious. And as any wild animal, uh, you have to treat, to treat them with respect. And uh, throughout the years, I was uh, diving more and more often with more and more species of sharks. And uh, then I could dive with my first uh, bigger shark and my first tiger shark like 20 years ago. And then so on, in 2007, I started free dive with great white sharks. And, uh, but the Mako shark came a bit later uh, because in fact, it's a very difficult shark to observe because his realm is offshore in the, the open ocean. So it's not places where we dive often and also it's blue desert. So you never know where to look for these sharks. And uh, when I moved to the Azores in 2012, I was starting to spend more and more time in the offshore water of the Northern Atlantic. And then of course, I started to encounter Mako sharks. And uh, of course, it's a very rare encounter, uh, but they're absolutely amazing um, animals. And uh, the, the first time you see a Mako shark, you see it's, uh, it's a very, very dif different animal than the other uh, sharks. Uh, the, the reason for that is he's really a top predator, he's a hunter. His behavior is a bit like the great white shark, he's trying to ambush and run to his prey. Uh, so when you see them appearing uh, during an offshore dive, it's always a very special moment uh, because they look more nervous, more, uh, I don't like the word aggressive, but they are very edgy. They have a very edgy personality. Usually the encounter never lasts long. They stay a few seconds, at the most a few minutes. And when the curiosity is satisfied, they go on like they, they arrive, they, they appear and disappear from nowhere. Uh, so very interesting animal. Uh, and of course, uh, the nature of uh, his habitat and his behavior makes him very vulnerable. Uh, very vulnerable to the long liners uh, because he's, even though he was not a, f a real target before, uh, it became a target uh, from the fisheries when the saltfish fisheries and the tuna fisheries declined because that's how all the blue sharks and maker shark gets uh, fished. Uh, basically, it's because it's, uh, it's, the fisheries is targeting other species. It was a bycatch, but now it's like the main animal. Um, an interesting story this year with the, the COVID uh, the, the long liners were not uh, active around the Azores from March to June. And I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, uh, but this summer we had a lot of sharks, more than usual. Uh, we got back to the, the level of shark we had during a dive uh, like almost 10 years ago. Uh, and we saw a lot of mako sharks this year. So I don't know if it's a coincidence uh, because of the reduction of the, the, the fisheries pressure, uh, but we had a very good year for sharks. And since a month now, the Spanish longliners are back. Uh, we see them on a weekly basis, two or three boats of floating sharks here in Ota. Uh, we see a lot of blue sharks and mako sharks uh, out of the, the boats to, the, to get into containers to be shipped back to the mainland. Uh, as you, most of you know, there's no quota rules on these sharks, so basically what they do is totally legal. Um, so the, the situation is quite serious in the, in the mid-Atlantic. And for me, the, the, the shark problem in, in the oceans and particularly in the northern Atlantic is uh, of course dramatic, but for me, it's more the symptom of our way of life. And, uh, and that's the main problem. Uh, 
we, we try to solve a problem, all these overfishing and shark fisheries, that's just a symptom of our way of life. So I think if we want to solve these issues, we need to think much forward than what we do at the moment and, uh, and, and solve the problem on a global level and in the way we function as a species and as a human society. Um, I think also amongst people who protect sharks and protect the environment, there's some kind of cognitive dissonance uh, because, okay, we protect sharks, but we still travel a lot. We protect sharks, but we drive a car. And all these things, although they, they, they seem very far away from the shark problem, they're all part of that problem. So if we want to find solution, we need to, to, to see it more as a global uh, problem and find global solution. Uh, but to come back to the shark conservation, um, I think the only thing we can do is to, to put pressure, of course, on our uh, political leaders that can change the policies and also to reach the general audience. A lot of people don't know about these topics. So our role is to, to bring that to the general media and uh, to have a critical mass that will be able to push uh, for better policy, policies and, of course, to, to have people stop uh, consuming um, shark product and uh, also product that come f um, that are causing the problem with the sharks which means uh, offshore fish and uh, open ocean fish like tuna salt fish and all that uh, so it's a very complex problem uh, but I'm positive we can of course do something to, to change a bit the, the course uh, but it's a big effort uh, so so please Talk about that um, all around uh, your circle of friends and, and people you know. Uh, it, it's, it's very important.